Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. So, this is part two in the series, Why They Hurt Everyone. Uh, yesterday, we took a look at family annihilators and why they annihilate their entire family. As tragic as it is, is there's a completely separate group out there. Those who kill their spouse, their significant other, and in some cases, kill their spouse, their significant other, and maybe one, two children, but will leave a survivor behind to deal with the aftermath, the trauma that they caused, but they don't see the cause of their trauma and how it affects other people. It's like suicide. When someone commits suicide, it's for selfish reasons. They do not see the pain, the suffering that others who have to clean up the mess of their act must go through, deal with the, the trauma, the loss. They don't see that. But these people who will kill their significant other, spouse, wife, you know, lover, whoever, they don't see it. So today, we're going to take a look at them. But first, I want to make a clarification and explain something from yesterday's video a little bit more. When I was talking about the jobs being shipped overseas and the loss of those jobs, that is just one little tiny part of the entire orange, the analogy I was using, the orange. The layers have been peeled away. There is no protection left for the orange. And each little segment of the orange has been divvied out to family, friends, children, wife, job. But when they lose that little piece that is the job, it's like a domino effect. And everything else may follow because it's the trigger. The last thing that they held true and they kept a tight grip on. And then everything just falls because they can't take it anymore in their mind. They have bottled everything up inside. And when I was talking about the jobs being shipped overseas, yes, there's a direct correlation between that. But there's also the direct correlation between severe depression and mental health issues in America. And we've let it go on far too long here already, ignoring what is going on. We give mental health this much of a budget every year. And then when jobs are shipped overseas and thousands of people lose their job, we still only have this much funding for it. And we have that much need, if not more. We stop all the outreach. We stop the early interventions that could, could stop these crimes from ever happening. So today, we're going to take a look at some of the reasons, according to the information that was gathered in the lab study, where they looked at 75 family annihilators, and they looked at 75 individuals who killed their spouses. Today, we're going to look at those. The 75 who killed their spouses, or killed their spouses and harmed their children. why they do it? Was it preventable? I don't know. We never tried. In all 75 cases, no mental health intervention was ever given to any member of the family. That includes the spouse who was murdered, children who were murdered, or the murderer himself or her. We ignored it and it could have been prevented maybe if we would have gotten some intervention, but we didn't. Why they do it? These are the most responded to reasons going from the, from the you know, greatest uh, um, reason to the least. Loss or instability in income. 
Either they didn't have a job, couldn't find a job, long-term unemployment. Employment was the number one reason. Finances along with that. Then, passion. Crimes of passion. They got so heated because they bottled everything up and they couldn't deal with it anymore. Or the other one did something to just set them off over and over again. And then finally they exploded. Jealousy is the next one. The other, the other spouse was able to move forward with their life. They found in financial independence. They found a way to survive outside of the family unit that they were currently in. Jealousy. Next one is secrets. One spouse holds a secret over the other one. Maybe they said and they, and they acted on it in the heat of an argument. I know what you did. I know about this. I know about that. Something. A secret that they didn't want to get out there into the world. They could not live with other people knowing about that. Sometimes it's sexual deviancy. Other times it's, you know, they maybe have committed a crime. Something along the line, but the one spouse used it against the other one in the heat of an argument. So the one spouse killed the other one. And yeah, it, it could fall underneath the passion, but they responded secrets. Next, largest one, protection of a fellow family member, either a child, an adult, someone that they were trying to protect, keep the murderer away from them, and did everything they could. Maybe the murderer was abusive towards a child, mentally, physically, sexually. And the one, one spouse or parent tried to keep that person away from that child, or in some cases, an elder. They were financially abusing and using an elder member of their family. So they tried to protect them. And finally, the murderer just couldn't take it anymore for the intervention, you know, the in, in interaction that was happening. Along with that comes the loss, possible loss of a child. Maybe CPS got involved or child, you know, child protection agency got involved and they were in fear of losing their children. So they killed the other spouse. And they had planned on killing themselves. Maybe they killed the child as well that was involved. Or they, maybe they left them behind. Next, as silly as it sounds, boredom. Boredom. They wanted a change so bad. But they just couldn't stand the life that they were living in anymore. So they killed them out of boredom. Family killers and people who kill their significant others, they do it for a lot of different reasons. Predominantly, they're, those are the ones that they, they do, and they answered on the surveys. Now, I should add that of the 75 that they studied, the 75 that they did are all confessors. They confessed to their crimes. Not, not because they were, they were found guilty later on. They said they didn't do it because it came up with something, you know, as long as I have home intruder broke in and killed everybody and, you know, I'm here. One of the other things that a lot of these uh, family killers and spousal killers do is they always leave behind someone who is close to the family, either a child or they leave somebody else behind to tell the story of what happened. They want the media attention. 
They want people to know their story. They want to know how much they suffered, be it right or wrong. They want people to know. It's sad, extremely sad that we live in a world where anyone thinks that either annihilating the entire family or killing your spouse and maybe two out of the four children and leaving two behind to deal with the pain and suffering is the right way to go. But we do. Yeah. In almost every one of these circumstances where there was a spousal killer in the 75 that were interviewed as part of this ongoing study, there was a way to stop the crime from happening. Intervention with a trained counselor, someone who could see the actual signs. And every one of these spouses that was killed knew exactly beforehand that this person was capable of doing this. They knew somewhere along the lines that this person was capable of doing something like this. Either in the past they acted violently towards them, them or they knew they, you know, and they acted out aggressively towards them or a child. They knew the signs were there that they could be this family killer or they would kill them someday. They knew it. And a lot of you know, the instances when the husband had killed the wife or girlfriend, they knew that this person had had a violent history. They knew that they were aggressive towards them and others, but yet they stayed, they loved them, and they prayed every day that this person would just change instantly overnight and all this would just go away. Lying to themselves, crying themselves to sleep every night, knowing what the inevitable end was. Instead of seeking the help to stop this before it got to this point, they put their faces in prayer. It didn't work. It didn't mean that God did not hear their, their prayers. The devil, the evil, the vileness of the killer was stronger than their prayer and nothing was going to stop them from doing what they did. We live in a sad, sick, twisted world. And you never know who's going to kill their spouse. There's no sign. We can't say it's every man that's uh, five foot seven and above. We can't say it's every woman who's under five foot five. It's not white, it's not black, it's not Latino, it's not Asian. Not Middle Eastern either. People who kill their spouses come from poor, rich, middle class. They come from educated families. They come from uneducated families. But yet, it happened. And it's going to continue happening as long as human beings are around on this earth. So, thank you again for stopping by and watching part two of uh, this series. And I guess we'll get back to uh, talking about the aftermath of people who kill others in the next video. You stay safe out there.